So this book, this, <laughs> I think my, my, my take, galley has, uh, notes, <laughs> now this galley has been through biblical misadventures, uh, flood, fire, and I guess we're here for the brimstone. Uh, but, uh, but I think of this book as a grand thought experiment that uses philosophy and physics as, a thought, as the active agents and literature as the catalyst. And I also had a very strange experience of reading this and kind of traveling through the canon of fascination with time travel, which is a fairly modern fascination, at the publication of The Time Machine in 1895. So how did you identify that as a starting point? And how did you draw the line between that and what you call the time travelish precursors? Like, um, because, because that is the starting point. I mean, it's not just it's not just our fascination with time travel. I am saying that literally there was no such thing as time travel before H.G. Wells. What about Which, the magic carpet in Arabian Nights and the time travel by blunt blow to the head in Connecticut Yankee? Right, okay, well, we can get to that. And there's other stuff, <laughs> there's other stuff in the past, but time travel, the words time travel, they just, I mean, you can look you could scour the literature of the past and you will never see time travel as a phrase. So that's a literal thing. But also, time travel implies that you're, you're going of your own free will from one place in time to another place. And so yes, so before that, Rip Van Winkle falls asleep and he wakes up. Is that time travel? Well, sort of, because, because we have time travel on our minds. We have time travel in our heads. We know all about time travel. So to us, that looks like time travel. And there are ancient Asian legends like Rip Van Winkle where people fall asleep or vanish into the future, but that's not the same as traveling into the future, that's just falling asleep and waiting till the future arrives. Well, we do mental, mental time travel all the time in memory and in sort of right. foresight. And we can call that mental time travel and psychologists do call it mental time travel. But that's because we're so expert on time travel. They didn't call it mental time travel then. I'm not saying people weren't aware of the past or they didn't think about the future. I am actually saying that they weren't nearly as fluid in their ability to mentally move from past to future. I mean, I think we've, part of the point of my book is that we've gotten very expert at it. But I want to go back to Connecticut Yankee because you, you mentioned that. And so a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, he Which does- Which published six years before. Right, so that's a little before H.G. Wells. Six years? I was going to say five years, but I bet you're right. <laughs> um, so you, you remember a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court. The Yankee is named Hank, and he's a factory engineer. He's a can-do guy. He's, up to, he's a geek, because Mark Twain was sort of a geek. You know, Mark Twain was the first, I believe, the first writer to... He was a typewriter. He was a typewriter. <laughs> and he was the first guy on his block to use a telephone. He loved all of that stuff. And um, so Hank, the mechanism of time travel is he gets whacked on the head and he's unconscious. And he wakes up in a, and the factory is gone and he's out in a green field and there's a town on the horizon and there's a, a horse and a knight in armor. And he says, Bridgeport? And the knight says, Camelot. <laughs> great, a great bit of dialogue. But the point is, I mean, kind of, I haven't even said how, how why H.G. Wells is inventing time travel, as I claim he is, in 1895. But, but it has a lot to do with technology. And Mark Twain's story is all about technology. It's all about a sudden awareness that all of these gadgets are new and they didn't exist in medieval times. And it's, so it's possible for H.G. Wells to, to draw a comic contrast between the worlds in which you've got mirrors and gunpowder 
I forget what else Hank brings back to King Arthur's court, but Hank is, of course, Hank is a wizard because he has all of this modern knowledge. Well, let's go back to the phrase of sudden awareness because I think one of the most beautiful things about the book is that it raises these larger questions about why we think about time at all, what are, what are the technologies and modes of thought that have pushed us in this direction, why its directionality troubles us as much as it does, and most of all, why a scientific impossibility is such fertile ground for the artistic imagination. So the sudden awareness is not quite sudden because it's this incremental buildup of technologies and, and types of thinking and directions of thought that converge into this tipping point where suddenly, seemingly suddenly, right. we have a this. A new thing happens. And so what is this? I mean, the premise is basically that H.G. Wells, in publishing The Time Machine, didn't just publish a piece of fiction. He created an aesthetic of thought. Yeah. How was he able to do that? And how did you awaken to this sudden realization that he had? Yeah, I, I don't even remember how how I realized this. I mean, I, I just always assumed, as I think most people assume, that time travel was just an obvious idea, that it was just, why did anybody have to discover it or invent it or think it up? Because we're, we're born knowing all about it. I mean, I know eight-year-olds who argue about the various paradoxes of time travel. But, and, so, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, the question is, why not before and also why now? And the answer, this was sort of the first challenge, the first problem that I tried to deal with in the book. Why not before? Why now? What was happening? It wasn't that people hadn't thought about time. Philosophers had thought about time since the, early, since the beginning of recorded history. And Isaac Newton had um, made scientists think about time in a whole new way in the 17th century. And, um, but nobody thought about the future as a place where life was going to be completely different and there would be marvels and, and humanity might have changed. And the reason suddenly it was possible to start thinking that way at the end of the 19th century was there was the new geology of Lyle, which the young H.G. Wells had studied as a, as a student, where suddenly you're digging through the earth and you see the, you see the history of the earth in buried layers. And there was the new biology of Darwin, that, where the history of life was suddenly unfolding in, in, a, in, a, in an onward march. And Wells studied that stuff too. And so, and suddenly, of course, everybody was realizing that the earth was not just 6,000 years old. And you Everybody could, except the people who still believe that it is. <laughs> many people were realizing that the earth was not 6,000 years old. And Wells was one of these people. He was, this was his first novel, I should say. He was in his 20s. He was a young man trying to establish himself as a writer. He had a fantastic story that he wanted to tell, but he was interested in the future, entirely in the future. He had this time machine that he invented. It had levers. He could go either way. You'd think maybe he was interested in history, too. He could have gone back and met Shakespeare or Queen Elizabeth or something, but he, did, he never did that. Well, what's interesting is that 1895, is a decade before Einstein's theory of relativity. And you say, you, you suggest, that the physicists were kind of inspired by this new art of science fiction, that it's not a coincidence that the whole question of space-time emerged shortly after this. Yeah, there, there is an, there's an odd thing that has to be explained. And, and the odd thing is this for those of you who don't remember the time machine. It starts with, I mean, if you were writing the time machine today, if H.G. Wells was writing it today, I think he would just leap right into the adventure because that's what he cares about. But he can't do that because nobody knows about time travel, so he has to justify it. And he justifies it by having his protagonist, who is only called the time traveler, explain to his friends that 
how this new machine that they're not going to believe in is possible. And what he explains is everything you know about time is wrong. And remember in geometry they taught you that there were only three dimensions, length, width, and height? Well, isn't, think about it, isn't duration a fourth dimension, he tells them. You know, and you know, we, well, we all know that, that time is the fourth dimension, right? And we, I, think, I think we learn that by osmosis, practically. Um, but nobody thought that then. And as you say, Einstein was 10 years later. And Einstein does treat time very seriously as, the, as a fourth dimension. And Minkowski creates the sense of a four-dimensional space-time continuum, where space and time can no longer be spoken of as separate things. And it's a new, this new grand view of science. So what's going on? Did H.G. Wells you know, have a time machine and, and read Einstein? Or did Einstein read the time machine? No, I don't think so. I mean, what I think is they're living in the same world. They're breathing the same air and absorbing the same ideas and, most important, experiencing the effects of the same technologies. You know, they're seeing, Wells is looking at railroad trains zooming across the landscape. And when you get on a railroad train, you are doing this marvelous new thing that's kind of a little like time travel. And it becomes a, almost literally a kind of time travel because the railroads forced, the railroads made it necessary to establish time zones because people had to come to grips with the fact that previously was only theoretical or known to mathematicians, that it's a different time in you know, London and Paris. Well, the, the railroads are one of the technologies that really propelled this new way of thinking, including the telegraph and other things. But very early on in the 20th century and very early on in the book, it becomes kind of clear that time and information can't really be disentwined very easily, if at all and that time is perhaps a kind of information or does it supersede information? Everything we do practically with time depends on information in a certain way. I mean, one thing that, one thing that clearly inspired Einstein was an understanding of clocks, railroad clocks that had to be made simultaneous synchronized, you know, the, the railroad clock here had to have exactly the same time as the clock there. And so how did they do that? They sent electrical signals up and down the line. They used telegraph signals to synchronize clocks. Well, the telegraph signals were sent at light speed. And so Einstein immediately is, has in his mind this paradigm of, of clocks in different places being synchronized by a piece of information that is not instantaneously available at both places, but has to travel at light speed. And f for all of the technical reasons so beloved of physicists, that made, it, made relativity necessary, it made it possible and made it necessary. Um, H.G. Wells wasn't thinking about anything like that, I should say. So is it possible that we wish and long for time travel in part as a response to the tyranny of simultaneity? Meaning, even today, at this very moment, you know, at the New York Public Library, Rebecca Solnit is talking about New York maps, and, and in a bookstore in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn five Alexandra five Horowitz is left. talking about <laughs> dogs. Exactly, the, the unlived life and the notion that we only have this moment at this point in time allotted to us, and there is no flight from it. And, and making sense of that is, or, or coming to terms with that is, one of the difficult necessities of existence. And it's part of the same necessity as making peace with our finitude and our mortality. And so when Einstein was trying to kind of steer us to, towards simultaneity, he steered us into this cesspool of fright that, that that's, everything is going on all at once right now. 
time travel is a kind of relief from that in a way, isn't well, it? Well, that's an, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I mean, in a way, you're making you're making a nice segue to uh, to a new topic, and I, and I should say, p part of the point of the book becomes, why do we need time travel? I mean, Wells needed it because he wanted to explore the future, but the fun for me of of trying to figure out a history of this idea of time travel was then watching what happens, watching all the ways different writers played with time travel scenarios. And some of them very quickly started going into the past. They would send, there was, there's the wonderful um, Edith Nesbitt, who is a children's book author, uh, just a little bit younger than Wells and a friend of Wells, and wrote um, these wonderful books where her child heroes go into the past and they don't have a time machine, they have a magic amulet, and they meet fanciful historical characters. And this is kind of, I think you would have to say that Edith Nesbitt is the precursor of, of, um, of Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. <laughs> or is it Bob and Ted? Bill and Ted. And, and um, Sherman and Peabody for the few people who are old enough to remember that. This is so over my, my you're not, immigrant you're head. Not one of them. Okay, all right. And, but then other things happen. Then there are all kinds of things that, that are time travel stories. I mean, I think that Groundhog Day is a time travel story with, with Bill Murray reliving the same day over and over again. And he, he doesn't go anywhere. That's his problem. He's stuck in time. And yes, um, well, so, Virginia well, Woolf's Orlando is probably and Virginia the, Woolf's who, by Orlando. the way, was the, they tried to Vita Sackville West, who was uh, her one-time lover and lifelong friend. When she was courting her, she tried to seduce her to join a writers' group by saying that she could be seated next to H.G. Wells. And Virginia, being Virginia, just didn't care and declined. Uh, but so Orlando did happen, which is her love letter to Vita Sackville West, which is this magnum opus of time travel in the 20th century. I would consider it one of the most beautiful works of time travel. I, I agree with you. And I would say sort of, I would also say more generally that, because this is part of my story too, that Virginia Woolf and James Joyce and Marcel Proust, not science fiction writers, but the great modernist literary heroes of the beginning of the 20th century were suddenly all talking about time. They were all dealing with time. I haven't really, I haven't gotten, <coughs> we're, we keep digressing, I haven't gotten to your question about simultaneity. <laughs> but what, because what I wanted to say is, in the end it feels as though there are a lot of different motivations for time travel stories. And, and yeah, I'm willing to agree with you that a, f a fear of, sim what, what did you say, fear of simultaneity? Well, the terror of it, the, the, the tyranny. Desire to, to break away from it mm -hmm. is, is one of them. I mean, in, in the case of uh, Groundhog Day, what's the motivation of that story? It's telling us something about, we often want to do it. We want to do things over. We want to do over. We want, we think, well, that day I certainly screwed that up, uh, you know. Couldn't but there's I also, start from scratch? I think, a temporal direction to our fears and our longings. And, you know, in the 16th century, Montaigne wrote that to lament not living in a hundred years is the same folly as to lament not having lived a hundred years before in talking about why we're so afraid of mortality. But we are so afraid of mortality because our fears have a temporal direction and it's forward. We're only afraid of what's to come and regret has a temporal direction, which is backward. We can only regret what has happened. So I don't know. I mean, well, this is what you're. This is a very time travelish way of speaking. <laughs> it I, is. I would it say. Is. I mean, this is this is the kind of thinking that I think it becomes possible in our era because we have all of this time travel in our blood. Mm. That's that's kind of that's part of my argument is that you can say very complicated things like that. You can say, how come we don't remember the future? No. And even the phrasing, I mean, so much of the book is almost a condemnation of how imperfect and downright inept our metaphors for time are. And why is it that language and logic just fail to cohere in a good way around time? Yeah. Why hasn't anybody been able to explain to us definitively what time is? I mean, the physics. And all we have instead are quips and aphorisms and these kind right. of. 
shorthand witticisms. Yeah, I mean, you'd think you could go to a dictionary or you could go to a physicist to get away from the metaphors. I mean, the metaphors are time is like a river, Borges like that one. Time is a river that sweeps me along, but I am the river. <laughs> but Maria can quote the entire poem, I think. <laughs> um, and so, but so think about that. Is time a river that carries us along? Or are we moving through time? Does time pass? Is time something that we save or waste or spend? You know, we use all of these metaphors and we use them sometimes in the same sentence. And, and then if we look at what we just said, we might, we might um, harshly think that we had just contradicted ourselves. Um, to that end, <laughs> the epigraph that you open with is one of them is from Auden, and it says, "And tomorrow comes, it's a world, it's a way." Now, your book Faster, which you wrote quite a bit earlier, and is probably the closest kin to time travel, also features an epigraph from Auden, and that one reads, "Clocks cannot tell our time of day for what event to pray, because we have no time, because we have no time until we know what time we fill." why time is other than time was. Ooh, that's good, I'd forgotten that. <laughs> but I would argue what you argue, which is that this kind of poetic thought would not have been possible before. Yes, that's right. Auden is, that's, he's playing around. He's playing with ideas of time. And I, what, you know, what I believe, even though I'm supposedly a science writer and I've written books about physicists what I believe is that, or what I came to believe in, in doing this book, is that physicists don't have a monopoly on the subject of time. They are not any better able to explain what time is mm. than the rest of us. And so what do physicists say when you ask them? Um, Richard Feynman said, Time is what happens when nothing else does. Okay, so are we thinking about that? Time is what happens when nothing else does. Is that true? I mean, do you well, think I mean, that's Well, I mean, that's correct? a Feynman-ish aphorism. Okay, and so is it just a joke? There, I mean, actually, he's saying something, and he's saying something that I think he might not have actually believed. That is, I think Isaac Newton would say, time is what happens when nothing else does. Suppose the universe was completely empty. Isaac Newton would say, time marches on anyway, and space is there anyway. And, you know, he got into a big argument with Leibniz at the same time, who didn't see it that way, who said it wouldn't make sense to talk about time in an empty universe, because time is what we use to measure change. And in an empty universe, nothing is changing, and there wouldn't be any clocks. So I hope I'm not getting too deep into the weeds here. But um, conversely, or on a whole different track, John Archibald Wheeler says, time is nature's way of keeping everything from happening all at once. Now, and Susan Sontag, who, by the way, this book is a masterwork of footnotes. I believe it's your only book that doesn't have end notes and that everything is in the footnotes. And I personally greatly appreciate that because I have long espoused the rather obvious conviction that literature is the original internet and that every footnote and every citation and every allusion is essentially a hyperlink to another text, which is really how our brains work. We, we work in these associative trails. Um, and so it reads very naturally. It reads the way that thought occurs mid-sentence when you connect it to something else and it fills this new way of meaning. But the second footnote in the book is from Susan Sontag and um, it says, she was, she's riffing on an old aphorism similar to the Wheeler one, which she had overheard from a grad student and kind of improves upon it. And she says, time exists in order that everything doesn't happen all at once and space exists so that it doesn't all happen to you. <laughs> now, some decades earlier, actually, Sontag had written in her diary that aphoristic thinking is lazy thinking which is a kind of a short-circuiting of time and of duration that she thought was intellectually, you know, infirm. Um, but on this very stage in 1992, Susan Sontag gave a wonderful lecture on the project of literature, and in it she said that 
only a tiny fraction of what is published in book form qualifies as literature. And I would argue that in probably science fiction about time travel, that percentage is even lower because the standards are higher. Um, and, and I mean, the point of which all is this question of are these shorthand aphorisms do they offer any kind of insight into the nature of time, into the nature of our time consciousness, or are they a cop-out that right. thinkers use to avoid the question? Uh, well, of course, I think they're kind of a cop-out. And, and I also, you know, I think these physicists, well, I've picked, I've picked um, a couple that sound a little like wisecracks, but, but everybody likes a bumper sticker definition for, for difficult things, right? Uh, I mean, a, a, a very serious, uh, an attempt to define time by a serious physicist, Lee Smolin, is he says, time is what clocks measure, mm -hmm. which isn't meant to be a joke. It's, and I don't even know how to say whether I think that's valid or not. I mean, it, it seems to have an obvious problem because What's a clock? Well, it's a logical Mobius strip is what right, it is. Right, because a clock is defined as the thing that measures time. So, so then where are you? So you're in a loop. But, but I know that he's actually trying to say something profound. Dictionaries, though, are meant to give us compact, if not bumper sticker, definitions for things. And I, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, and maybe you're trying to push me into saying, is that Time, I don't think, is one of those things that can be pinned down that way. I don't think we want to pin it down that way. I, sh I should quote Augustine now. Bec and he's the most famous, this is the most famous thing, I think, probably, that anybody has said about time. And it's been quoted many times since. He said, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know. But as soon as I have to explain it, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody who built on that when you were six years old was your mother, who published a children's book called okay. Time is When. And it is, I've acquired a first edition, and it is, lo and behold, a vintage children's book about time and what we do with it and how we experience it. and. It's a lovely illustrated kind of philosophical primer on what this thing time is. And the, this, the title itself, Time is When, is pretty much the St. Augustine logical loop of self-definition and <laughs> eternity as, as the snake with its tail in its own mouth. Uh, what was it like to grow up with that, or right. did you're, you not? You're completely sandbagging me here. And I <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that my sister in the front row is, has now burst into tears. <laughs> um, yes, okay, this is, this, is, this is my mother's book, Time is When. My mother, I should, my mother, Beth, lived most of her life a quarter of a mile from here and spent many hours in this, in this place. And time travel is dedic dedicated to her? And... Um, yeah, she was. She set out in this book, her only book, her only published book, to explain to children who have a lot of questions what time is. Were you one of those children? I'm sure I was. <laughs> um, and uh, I think it's just a great title. That's why I couldn't resist mentioning it, because it's the shortest of all of the bumper sticker definitions of time. It doesn't really tell you that that much, but but well, it's good. Toward the end of the book, um, you write, we experience childhood one way when we're living in it and another way when we relive it in memory. And when we become parents ourselves, we may rediscover our own parents and our own childhoods as if for the first time. That's the closest we get to having a time machine. That's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, Again, I asked myself many times, what are these time travel stories for? And what are they about? And when you look at them, you start to see, you start to see themes in them. And they have an emotional content. I, I mean, I should say, there's no such thing as time travel, right? 
I, I mean, I, time travel is impossible. I don't actually believe in time travel. I, now another 10 people just left. <laughs> Um, no, they left so, yesterday, don't worry. So, <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm thinking about that. <laughs> so, so what's going on? Well, a lot of different things happen. If you think about, for example, the Back to the Future movies, the, the, the surface fun of the story is that now the time machine is a DeLorean, and he races down the road, and zoom, he's in the past. But what's really going on What's really happening there, what's the, what's the emotional content of the story is here's a teenager who reaches a certain age and he looks at his parents and a little bell goes off and he thinks, oh, wow, they were teenagers once. I'm almost as old as they are. Did they have the, the kinds of feelings that I'm having now for the first time? And here's a way of exploring that. He can go back and watch his parents falling in love and then hilarity ensues. But there are a lot of time travel stories I started to notice when I started to think about it that are about the search for fathers and mothers or the search for lost children. And um, Well, this really is a search for fragments of the self. And the self is so deeply entwined with this question of time travel. And in fact, on page 99, and I mentioned the number because I was expecting this to appear on page nine at the latest. But you say, we reach, and it won't be the last time, the problem of free will. Now, the problem of free will is completely inseparable from this question of time travel, and even from our temporal consciousness and how we experience time in our day-to-day -day lives and in our mental time travel and in our memory. So what is free will, and how did Einstein and Minkowski kind of you know, unlatch this door into the unknown? Well, there, there are two ways I could try to talk about that. And when you, when you start talking about the physicists, then we could, we could go, we could take the high road or the low road. I'm kind of inclined to take the low road, <laughs> even though you want to take the high road. I mean, the high, the high road is physicists make it difficult to believe in free will, and a lot of physicists don't like the idea of free will. You say it's not a happy topic for a physicist. <laughs> and, um, and that's because of this four-dimensional space-time continuum again. If you're going to imagine, which, which was essential for a version of time travel, a kind of literal version of time travel, if you're going to arrive in the future, you're sort of saying the future's already there waiting for me to arrive. And if you're going to arrive in the past, you're kind of saying the past is still there, which is contrary to our everyday view of things, our everyday view of things, the man in the street view, which also happens to be my final view, is that the past is gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Well, that's the whole problem with time travel, though, and because we treat it as a region that we can revisit, a right. region of the present that is travelable too. And the future hasn't happened yet, we feel, or I feel. It's open. Different things can happen. And so that allows for free will. And so in a way, both the physicists and the time travelers start to have a problem with free will. But now let me take the low road. I mean, this is sort of the fun part. And this is where it, how it gets into the story on page 99. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> There's a, an early science fiction story by Robert Heinlein called By His Bootstraps that's the first attempt to explore logically what happens when you go back in time and you meet yourself, which maybe it's not the first. Anyway, it starts with, it starts with Bob, our, our hero, sitting alone in a room working on his dissertation about something, some pompous title that has to do with time, and suddenly a hole opens in the air behind him, and another man steps out who looks suspiciously like Bob. And he says, call me Joe. Hi, call me Joe. And, and, but we know, because we're smart about time travel, that this is just Bob a few days later returning in time. But Bob, number one, doesn't know this yet. He doesn't even recognize himself, if you're willing to suspend disbelief. And then they have conversation. And then the phone rings. and. A third Bob says, don't listen to Joe, whatever you do. 
And it get, the plot gets very complicated, but at some point, Heinlein forces us, forces himself to think about what's going on. If Bob number one and Bob number two are having this conversation, Bob number two should remember having had the conversation. And why is he then reciting the same words? Is he just following a script that is written for him? And if he wants to, can he break out of this conversation that he already had and ought to remember? And at some point, Bob number three or Bob number four actually starts to worry about this and try to break the chain and discovers that he can't. And so we're, we're speculating about free will in the pages of a pulp magazine in a, in a way that I think is just as interesting and just as smart as the philosophers down the road who are using more highfalutin language. And so I guess this is another one of the arguments that I'm making in this book, that, that wisdom on these subjects is not coming exclusively from any of these quarters, from the scientists or the philosophers or the great literary stars or the pulp science fiction writers. They're all kind of working together, not exactly in parallel, but and informing each other, however resentfully at times. Informing each other, exactly. Because sometimes they do. I, I mean, Einstein wasn't reading H.G. Wells, but there's no doubt that most physicists today grew up reading time travel stories and know all about it. Well, I, you mentioned in the book um, was probably the best proof that time travel is a scientific impossibility, which was Stephen Hawking deciding to host a party for time travelers and <laughs> nobody shows up. <laughs> right. Steve, he sends out an invitation and says, the party, dear time travelers, the party was held on such and such a date in the past. <laughs> and then he says, hey, everybody, nobody showed up. And so he says, that proves that time travel is impossible, which he believed in the first place. But of course, we should also notice that Hawking can't resist engaging in the paradoxes and having the discussion and playing around with time travel as an idea. And he, specs, he speculates about it in serious scientific papers. And it's also embedded in his most recent work on whether information escapes from a black hole or not, um, which goes to the question of time as a measure of information or, or as woven of information, and, and space-time being you know. The, play, the, the sandbox in which we test these ideas out. But you, toward the end of the book, you offer your own aphorism or definition or whatever you want to call it. You say, what is time? Things change, and time is how we keep track. And you kind of suggest that change is the only constant, that change is all there is, and what we perceive are these kind of slices of that. Why? Was this the formulation that you settled on, having critiqued so, you know, <laughs> I, imaginatively other yeah, definitions? Yeah, I kind of, I don't mean it to be an aphorism. I mean, I, I didn't construct it in the form of a definition exactly. I tried to. Well, it's an answer of it, some sort. It's sort of meant to be a sort of anti definition, an mm. anti aphorism. Yeah, things change. Time is how we keep track. OK, but, but I don't mean that to supersede all the other things that came before. It's meant to, I do think that change is the essential thing. Mm. That uh, I do, I'm with Leibniz more than Newton on this, on this age old question of, uh, even though I wrote a book about Newton. And I love Newton, in case he's listening. <laughs> um, in case he listened. <laughs> I think Leibniz is right. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it makes sense to think about time in the absence of things changing. Mm. Um, well, bringing up Newton, structurally, this book, I mean, clearly, it's a kind of bibliography or, or a library of babble of your own mind. You bring so much of yourself and your previous selves into this inquiry. You, you draw on your biography of Newton, you quote Feynman 
quite a bit. I, kind of, I only know so many things. Well, you know? right, but that's, I think it's such a beautiful meta illustration of this notion that, I mean, the, the, one of the big problems with time travel fiction, which problem in a good way, creative problems that the best stories solve in imaginative ways, is this notion that nothing has a single cause, that going back into the past and tweaking one thing changes everything, you know? And it's true of uh, our identity and our selfhood as this kind of cumulative Rube Goldberg machine of choices and chances that we take throughout life to become who we are. And for you, this is very much a product of that, that, that builds on the information, bring, builds on faster. On page 129, you says, we have to talk about entropy at some point, building on chaos. And all of these kind of cumulative selfhoods that we build toward our whole lives. And I wonder, was your interest in time travel and in why we think about time travel in part a reflection of looking back on your own becoming, your own composition? Oh, you've just said so many interesting things, and I want to, I want to see if I can steer away from the self-psychoanalysis, because I don't know. I don't I mean don't, it from a psychoanalytical, I, I mean it from why. a creative... Uh, but, but you've made, just to, if I can highlight a couple of things you just said, one of them is, um, and the, an issue in time travel is causality, what causes what, and and can you undo them? And uh, is there a single cause of things? And, and there's a whole subclass of time travel stories that, that wrestles with questions of, so okay, suppose you can go back in the past and you can start changing things, what happens? Can you kill Hitler? You know, if you do kill Hitler, are you gonna get the desired result? Can, could you go back in time and teach, teach baby Donald manners? <laughs> um, some time, I mean, time travel writers sort of have to make a decision one way or another, and some of them actually decide, okay, things will change in all kinds of weird ways, and they tell the story that way, and others decide, no, if we tinker with the past, we're going to discover that we can't really change history because history is what it was, and they tell the story that way. And Yes, another subclass of time travel stories is the class that, I think of these as time travel stories anyway, that looks back at history and, and creates alternative histories. Like Philip Roth's novel a few years ago, The Plot Against America, where the fascists won. And um, Philip K. Dick's story, The Man in the High Castle, where not quite in the same way, America lost World War II and the, the Japanese and the Germans are in charge. And so all of these are ways of reimagining our past. And maybe you're asking if I'm trying to reimagine my past and maybe I, maybe I am. Or it, I guess my point was more, was this book absolutely inevitable given your past. No, I, I exercise free will. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 honestly, it felt like an accident. I mean, you're making it seem very deliberate, and you're right that, that one can find themes from my earlier work. And I do, I will insist that partly that's because those are the things that I know. But, um, you know, things look inevitable in hindsight. Maybe that's, that's another le lesson of time travel. And on that beautiful note, I think we should open it up to some questions, um, if we have some note cards. Oh, so how do we get the questions? Somebody's oh, here, the here they come. Yeah. Thank you, Adele. All right, let's see. I was instructed to choose. Okay, we can go with that. <laughs> um, would you agree with the idea that time is a figment of our consciousness? A figment? A, 
is this figment or function? Function of our consciousness. A function or a figment. It's interesting that I, <laughs> I guess I answered it in calling it a figment. <laughs> well, this is, an, this is sort of an age old debate. I mean, one thing, one thing that humans have always known about time long before we did time travel is that, is that it changes psychologically. They're in all kinds of psychological ways. It passes more quickly when we're having fun or when we're busy, maybe. It passes more quickly when we're young than when we're old. And so when Newton decided that he was gonna take over time and steal it for the scientists, he had to very explicitly separate psychological time from physical time. And this debate continues in our century. Um, Einstein, even though he revised Newton's thinking in so many ways, is very much on Newton's side, and he wanted to keep it for the scientists too. And when he talks about time, even if, it's, even if he's destroyed the notion of perfect simultaneity, he's trying to talk about something that will exist even in the absence of human beings. So it's, for Einstein, time is not a function of our consciousness. But a lot of the way you and I have been talking tonight has been very much about time that can't be separated from consciousness. We're talking about memory, and we're talking about anticipation. We're talking about how we're thinking about how a human being creates a sense of the past and, and imagines a sense of the future. And those are, are very, I think, completely valid and interesting things to talk about, too. I want to read a short passage that I think is one of the most beautiful in the book, but also answers this question quite precisely. He writes, this is toward the very end. Physicists have developed a love-hate relationship with the problem of the self. On the one hand, it's none of their business. Leave it to the mere psychologists. On the other hand, trying to extricate the observer, the measurer, the accumulator of information from the cool description of nature has turned out to be impossible. Our consciousness is not some magical onlooker. It is part of the universe it tries to contemplate. The mind is what we experience most immediately and what does the experiencing. It is subject to the arrow of time. It creates memories as it goes. It models the world and continually compares these models with their predecessors. Whatever consciousness will turn out to be, it's not a moving flashlight illuminating successive slices of the four-dimensional space-time continuum. It is a dynamical system occurring in time, evolving in time, able to absorb bits of information from the past and process them, and able as well to create anticipation for the future. All right, why didn't I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question which we've kind of addressed, but we can take in a different direction. I should say, um, the only reason I'm not reading them is that we've addressed a lot of the ones on the cards. <clears throat> Time machines aside, is there a plausible scenario where the future can influence the past? So we go back to the causality, and you discuss whether a cause can, uh, an effect can precipitate a cause in right. this whole. Well, just to talk about the future, influencing the past sounds like a paradox right away, right? I mean, the, ob the obvious answer is no, because by definition, the future But the, the interesting question is happened. why not? Right, but when you start to think about it, there are ways in which our imagined futures, our, our sense of the future, our anticipation of the future affects our present behavior Right? We are not just living in the present. We are living in the future. And so for us, uh, this is starting, I'm starting to sound a little fortune cookie-ish to myself, but, but I, I kind of want to remain open to the idea that in, in, a, a, in a valid sense that wouldn't be recognized by a physicist, our future does influence our past. Our past was influenced by our future. When one of the most interesting chapters in the book, you discuss a function of that, which is our love of time capsules and why we do that, which you kind of dismiss as silly, but at the same time, they say so much about what of the present we want solidified as a past for a future and right. why we do that. 
Okay, this is another digression, and it's another, it's a digression. Voltaire said digression is the sunshine of narrative. We can abide thank, by thank him. Thank you, Maria. It's a, it's, a, it's a digression in the book, too. But I did, I suddenly thought, I felt, I very much wanted to write a chapter about time capsules and make the case that it belonged in a book about time travel. And time capsules were another kind of relatively new thing. People started burying things maybe in the late 19th century, but in the middle of the 20th century is when there was really a time capsule craze at World's Fairs and at other things. There were time capsules that got tremendous amounts of publicity and were, we would say now, crowdsourced. What was crowdsourced is the problem of what to put in, right? So the problem of the question for the time capsule is if you're gonna bury some stuff, it's a message to the people of the future you're, you want to tell them what you can about us, our civilization. One of these time capsules, there were you know, newspaper headlines that said, they buried the 20th century yesterday. <laughs> this in, in uh, you know, roughly 1950. So it's ridiculous to say that. What they buried was a bunch of knickknacks. And Including, was it stockings, <laughs> nylon stockings? stockings <laughs> um, cigarettes. Um, recordings of the voices of famous people, some microfilm, uh, some magazines, some child's toys. You know, they didn't have that much space, but they, they crammed things in. And they imagined, I think a little bit naively, that people of whatever year they chose were going to be waiting on tenterhooks to find out what was in the capsule. And uh, kind of the, the sad reality is that a lot more time capsules get buried than ever get dug up. Mm -hmm. they, they, mostly, they mostly get lost. Um, but I don't mean just to make fun of them. It's a, it's a, there's something profound about the impulse to send a message to the future, to take stock of who we are. I mean, I'm not convinced that sending a message to the future is the primary function of time capsules. I think it's sending a message to the present about what matters to us and who we are and what our values are and to some degree immortalizing our mortal selves. Right, but, but that's because you're, you're not taking them at their word. You're looking at their, at their real motivations, <laughs> right? I mean, they say it's a message to the future. They're talking explicitly to these people, of, these imagined people. And they're explaining, they're explaining how to, some of the time capsules contain guides to the English language because they realized that the language might have changed with well, diagrams of the mouth. Well, it, I mean, like the, an, an extreme case of that was the, I, I recently did an event about the golden record that sailed into space on the Voyager. And Carl Sagan dreamt it up because when he was a little boy, he went to the 1939 World's Fair and you know, saw the time capsule and then 40 years later, made this record and it was intended not just for the future but for an alien civilization to travel across space and time and it included a kind of legend of how to read things and because they couldn't pack the technology to play the record it was an actual golden you know record they included a little needle for the aliens to play the record right. with i mean <laughs> it's almost a caricature of the impulse for why we make this but it's a right. real deep human longing that makes us do that and I think that's the long-winded answer to the consciousness and time travel question and on that note we have run we have out of time. we have two minutes do you okay. want to shall we take another question well, let's true would you like to choose one you choose okay that's just a fun one I guess what literary or pop culture time travel device do you buy most, the most? Do I buy the most? Do you buy the most? I think in the figurative I, sense, mean, the buy, believe, or believe, or in. believe in. What literary or time travel device? Or pop culture, or time pop travel culture. device do you buy the most? Well, the machines disappeared pretty much. I mean, the machines almost became unnecessary. The, the machines, you know, Wells's machine was basically a bicycle. And then by the time movies started being made of the time machine, the machine was much more complicated. There's a movie where it looks like a big sled. But 
Then they started dispensing with the machines because we were familiar with it and they could just walk through portals and gates. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Another kind of time travel device, and maybe this is the one that I'm going to say I buy or believe in, is dreams. Mm. And just to prove that I'm not being vague or artsy fartsy, I'll, I'll mention the great Ursula K. Le Guin book, The Lathe of Heaven, mm -hmm. which is yet another weird variation on the time travel theme. And what happens is her protagonist dreams of the future, and when he dreams, that future is established. So he wakes up and the world has changed, and he's the only person who remembers that he has changed it. And it's partly a book about the power of dreaming, and it's partly a book about fear of the power of our own imaginations. And I would also add that it's a book about the multiplicity of consciousness and who is that consciousness that does the dreaming and how does it differ from the wakeful mind and is it still us and who are we really? Okay, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and we're officially out of time. Thank you Thank all you very so much, much for coming. Thank you, Maria. Thank you.